everyone, this is Mrs. Jane. I'm doing a read aloud of Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607 by Elisa Carbone. And we're on chapter 19, page 144. You must obey this now for a law that he that he that will not work shall not eat, except by sickness he be disabled. For the laborers of thirty or forty honest and industrious men shall not be consumed to maintain a hundred and fifty idle loiterers. Captain John Smith quoted in William Simmons, E.D., the proceedings. On September 10th, 1608, Captain John Smith takes the oath of office and becomes our new president. His official decree, he that will not work shall not eat, and he holds us to it. Gentlemen or not, any man who wants to have his supper has to pitch in. But even with this decree, he is well liked. Unlike Presidents Wingfield and Gradcliffe before him, Captain Smith divides the rations equally with us and works right alongside with us, sharing our burdens too. And he stays in the cabin that he's always shared with Reverend Hunt, John Layden, and the others. There will be no mansion in the woods for President Smith. There are a few gentlemen left from the group who tried to run off on the discovery with our food and I sometimes hear grumbling from them, but they are far too outnumbered by us now men and settlers, new and old, who have great respect and trust for Captain Smith. Now I am the page of a ruler. It is the most important I have ever felt in my life. I wish my mom could know, and I hope that she does know, taking a peek from heaven every now and then. She'd also be surprised to see that a commoner is our president. I think it would make her happy to see here in the new world, gentlemen don't hold all of the power. Captain Smith continues to write our story. He's also drawing maps of rivers and lands that he has found on his exploration trips. I'm relieved to find out that not all of his writings were destroyed in the fire. Some of the pages had already been sent back to England with Captain Newport. One day in late September, Richard and I are in the field harvesting vegetables. We have grown them the way Namantok taught us, planting the corn and beans together in a mound so that the bean plants can climb the corn stalks. Suddenly we hear shouts from the riverfront, ship ashore, and then a few moments later, she flies the British flag. Richard and I stop working and look at each other. Could it be Captain Newport so soon? Richard asks. I look at the baskets of beans and squash we'd already gathered. I hope we've done enough work to earn our supper and that no one minds if we go to greet the ship. Let's go see, I say. Other men come to the riverfront as well. We watch as the ship glides toward the shore. Captain Newport is at her helm. Another crowd of colonists to feed, no doubt, Henry grumbles. Let's hope they've sent us more skilled workers and fewer gentlemen, as I have requested, said President Smith. The ship anchors and the long boat is lowered, and the first few passengers begin to climb down the rope ladder. The late afternoon sun glints in my eyes, and at first I think what I'm seeing is a trick of the light. But then I hear the men around me are as amazed as I am. Could it be? My lord, it's a vision. How could they send women to this godforsaken place? As the long boat nears us, men trip over one another, rushing to help. Let me give her a hand. No, let me give her a hand. I'm surprised we don't have a fist fight before the long boat even lands. In the boat are a number of men, but all any of us sees are two women, sitting straight back, clutching satchels. One of the women is older and large, with a round face and double chin. The other woman, a girl really, has pale skin and dark frightened eyes. A few black curls peek from under her coif. I listen to the conversation as the longboat passengers are introduced to President Smith, Master Francis West, Master Daniel Tucker, and Master and Mrs. Thomas Forrest, and Mrs. Forrest's servant girl, Anne Burris. It has been a very long time since we have seen English women. It gives me a twinge of sadness of missing my mother to see their colorful petticoats, indigo, blue, and saffron yellow, and white coifs. It feels familiar, like home. Miss Anne Burris squints her eyes, scowls, and ignores the men who are trostling one another to have a chance to carry her satchel. She holds it tight to that satchel and turns her back to them. I feel sorry for her, being the center of attention like that when she obviously doesn't want to be. Namantok is on the next boat ashore. I am surprised to see that he is wearing a linen shirt. But England hasn't changed him too much. His hair is still shaved close on one side and long on the other, and his eyes are still bright. He beams at me. Hello, Samuel. How are you? He calls out in accented English. I am now a world traveler. I laugh. You are speaking English well, my friend, I call to him. I realize that in his months away, with no one to speak Algonquin with, he has had plenty of time to learn the English language, much more than the few words and phrases Reverend Hunt has taught him before he left. 
Namentok, where is your stick? I ask. Did you make lots of notches in it? Namentok shakes his head. Too many people, he says. I throw stick in river. Reverend Hunt is very happy that Namentok is now speaking English so well. He wastes no time but sits him down to tell him about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how he must bring the message of salvation to the other Powhatans. Namentok nods enthusiastically. Yes, yes, I learn of your gods in England, and I tell them of my gods. He launches into a lively discussion of Ochias, the vengeful god, who requires the sacrifices of tobacco, copper, beads, and sometimes animal blood, and sends punishment if he is not made happy. He tells us of about Ahone, a god who is all loving, all forgiving, who makes the sunshine and ripens the crops. He tells us of the great people The great respect his people have for the spirit of life that is in all things. People, animal, plants, fire, water, wind. Reverend Hunt shakes his head. There is only one God, maker of heaven and earth. Reverend Hunt tells the story of creation, how God made the world and all things in six days, and then rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Again, Namantok nods with interest. Now I tell you how our world was made, he says. He tells us a story about a great hare who created different kinds of men and women and put them into a big sack. He protected them from giants who wanted to eat them. The great hare filled the rivers with fish and put deer upon the land. Then he took the men and women out of the sack and put them in different places on earth to live. I enjoy Namantok's story but I could see Reverend Hunt is becoming discouraged. Namantok does not understand that he is to give up his gods and stories and take the word of God from the Bible back to his people. Reverend Hunt begins to explain again, but Captain Smith finds us boys sitting idle and tells Reverend Hunt that he needs to come work in the gardens. I put on my straw hat and pick up my basket. I hope Reverend Hunt is not too disappointed that his first time trying to convert a Virginia native to Christianity did not work out. Captain Newport has brought us 70 new colonists, stores, and the new part and news that the rocks we sent to England were, once again, just rocks. The Virginia Company has a new idea about how we can make a profit. We are to use the raw materials we have here in Virginia and begin making glass, pitch, tar, soap, and soap ashes to send back to England. They've sent us several Polish and German tradesmen to get us started with these projects. They have already begun to build a glass house a little ways from our fort with a large furnace for glass making. Captain Newport has also brought orders from the Virginia Company to place an English crown on Chief Powhatan's head, making him a prince under King James and making all of his people English subjects. My mind reels when I hear this. Chief Powhatan thinks we are his subjects, and now they want to make Powhatan people English subjects? The whole thing tangles my brain in knots. If the thought of being Chief Powhatan's subjects would be distasteful to the gentleman, then I imagine that becoming subjects of King James would be just as distasteful to the Powhatan people, especially after they hear Namantok's report on King James, whom he met while he was in England. Our Chief Powhatan is much better than your king, Namantok says, speaking in Algonquin so that the gentleman will not hear his assessment of our exalted king. Your king is a short, weak man. Our chief is tall and very strong. Your king has no hair and no teeth, just a round belly from eating too much. How can such a man be king? A look of disgust crossed Namantok's face, as if he's not quite sure how to tell me the next point. And he stinks. Does he not bathe? And he drinks wine until he can no longer speak or stand. I have heard stories about our King James. It is well known that the king's doctors have warned him that bathing causes the plague, and he has taken this advice to heart. He almost never bathes. Yet Englishmen still honor him. He is, after all, our king. Namantok feels no such obligation. The natives bathe quite often, even in cold weather, and they have no fear of the English plague, and only disdain for English stink. Our chief Powhatan is a true king, says Namantok. He is powerful and honorable. I'm about to have my first chance to meet the great chief Powhatan. Captain Smith is taking me and Namantok, along with three other men, over to land to wear Wokomoko. We are bringing an invitation to Chief Powhatan to come to Jamestown to receive gifts from King James and to be crowned. Captain Smith is angry at the whole plan. Very angry. Make an emperor into a prince. Ask an emperor to travel to receive gifts. I assure you this will not sit well with Chief Powhatan, he says. He is the king here in his own country. What right does King James have from across an ocean to make him his subject? 
Power is like weights and a balance. No one gains power without someone else losing power, and Chief Powhatan does not want to lose any of his power. It has been a long, hard road to peace with Chief Powhatan, but if he understands what this coronation means, it may well be the end of our peace. Captain Newport refuses to budge. He is bound to carry out the orders of the Virginia Company. And so, Captain Smith prepares for our journey to where Wogamoko. In the meantime, Miss Ann Burris has made quite an impression at Jamestown. She's almost always busy taking care of Mrs. Forrest, a very plump gentlewoman who hasn't figured out yet that life in Jamestown will be a lot harder than life in England. She is constantly making demands on Ann. Heat some water, wash these clothes, get the supper on the table. Mrs. Forrest insists on having her meals in her cabin with her husband, instead of eating at the communal cook pot with the rest of us. During the rare moments Anne is not busy, she has every unmarried man in the colony trying to get her attention. Even Nathaniel, who is 16 by now, makes a fool of himself strutting around in his armor, making a show of his musket and sword. There are at least two or three fistfights a day, and I have no doubt that they're because of Miss Anne Burris. She is 14 years old, so she is of marriageable age, and I suspect we will have a wedding before too long. One day, Richard Namantok and I are sent to repair the fish nets and bring back the catch for supper. We are the only ones at the riverfront when Anne comes down to fill buckets with water. Here, we can fill them, Richard offers. We are already barefoot and wet. He takes the buckets from her. Anne doesn't smile or say thank you. She just looks away. It is as if she has become afraid to look anyone in the eye for fear they will try to court her. We're just boys, I want to say. We'll be your friends. While we fill the buckets, Anne walks to where some wildflowers are growing and picks a small bouquet of yellow, purple, and white. Then it seems as if my unspoken message has somehow gotten through, because she comes and sits down near us. A moment of peace, she says, and rubs her sore shoulders. Your mistress works you hard, I say. I do not add what I've been thinking for weeks. You'll never live through the winter if you stay so skinny and tired. And I don't ask what I have been suspicious about. Is your mistress eating some of your food rations? Anne shrugs. No harder than I worked in England, she says. But I know that can't be true. President Smith says if we don't work, we don't eat, says Richard. I don't see your mistress doing too much work, but by the looks of her, she sure does a whole lot of eating. Richard Namatak and I laugh, but Anne scowls. Don't insult my mistress, she scolds, but we can't help ourselves. And soon she breaks down and laughs with us. When we settle, Anne says, Mistress Forrest makes me work every moment because she's afraid I'll find a beau. She blushes when she says it. Her husband says I should marry, but she wants to keep me as her maid. Have you found this beau? Namantok asks. Anne shakes her head. She's found a hundred of them, Richard exclaims, and this starts us all laughing again. Finally, Anne says, I better get back or I'll get a beating for dawdling, she says. We help her balance the yoke across our shoulders and lift the buckets of water. As I watch her walk back to the fort, I think that Mrs. Forrest should be made to do her own chores, and that Anne's best chance of making it through the winter will be to get away from that demanding woman. When she's gone, Richard asks, who do you think she'll marry if she gets permission? Maybe your wera wants, Captain Smith, Nimantok suggests. I shake my head. He's the only unmarried man not courting her. He must be too busy for marriage. As we repair the fishnets, we have fun guessing who Miss Ann Burris will pick if she gets permission to wed. I only hope she finds someone who will be kind to her and make sure she gets her full food rations. I have never dug a grave for a girl before, and I don't want to start now.